Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about what it's like to be a Salesforce administrator or analyst in the real world. So a lot of people know about Salesforce, they're interested in getting into Salesforce roles, but the question comes up after hours on Trailhead or getting your first certification or actually applying for jobs where you say, what is it I'm actually going to be doing? How can I mentally prepare? And imposter syndrome is very real in the Salesforce space where people have certifications, they apply for jobs, they get these roles, and then they start work on Monday and they're thinking, what is it I'm actually going to be doing? So we are going to be talking about exactly that. So in this video series, we're going to be talking about real world Salesforce requests, and this is video number one. So why should you listen to me when it comes to what happens in the real world of Salesforce? Because I hear a lot of people talk about this is what it's like, but then it turns out they've been working for the same company for the last three, four, five, 10 years, and they have no idea what it's like in the Salesforce space. They know what it's like being a Salesforce professional at one company, which makes them very uneducated on what it's like to be a Salesforce professional in the real world. They know about it from one company. So uh, I've been at this for 10 years and that doesn't necessarily give me any you know, reliability as a source. But when we look at other things I've done, so I was a junior admin uh, for a an electronic health records company for a year. I was a senior admin for two years working with a small consulting firm. And then I was a senior solution architect for three years working with firms like Blue Wolf, IBM, Rackspace, Relation Edge, um, and, and a few others. So I've worked with a lot of consulting firms. And I'll say, when you work with consulting firms, especially for a number of years, you get very comfortable working in different industries, different types of projects, different types of requirements, different types of clients. And you get a very diverse understanding of what different types, different sizes, different industries of Salesforce uh, customers what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're doing it. And you get very comfortable understanding how companies are using Salesforce. So now in the last six years, I've been owning and operating my own Salesforce consulting business. So uh, that was named Honest IT LLC and the naming of it doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is uh, in that time, in that span, uh, I've worked right out about 150 different projects for different companies. Um, some of those companies are long term, two or three years. Some of those companies are a 50 hour project in just a couple of weeks. Uh, so the variety is totally different depending on the complexity of the Salesforce org, the size of the company, the needs of the company. So I've had a ton of exposure to what different companies are doing and the types of requests you can expect to get in the real world, not just at one company, but from a variety of companies in the real world. So. That's what I want to expose you to. That's what I want you to better understand is what are people actually going to ask you to do when it comes to doing Salesforce work? Now, the bottom line is I've seen a lot and a lot of people think, oh, what's a Salesforce admin do? What's a Salesforce analyst do? What does a consultant do? And those questions are far too generic because companies treat different people differently. So let's take a look at this. Are all companies the same? Are all jobs the same? Of course not. It depends very much on the size of the company, the complexity of the org, the number of third-party applications that they use, and of course, the number of Salesforce professionals working at the job. You could have a company that's using just you. You're the sole administrator or the sole professional. In other companies, you could have a team of four or five people or more. So it's based, uh, based very much on the complexity of the org and the differences that those companies have. Now, coming down, um, did you know most companies overlap these roles? I've had people say, hey, Brad, I'm a business analyst, a Salesforce analyst, and I had no idea that this is what the job was. You should tell more people that this is what the job is. And then I have them tell me about the job and I say, that's actually not what a business analyst is supposed to do at all. That's just what your company calls a business analyst. And the same goes for developers, admins, architects, analysts. Uh, you name it. They have different names for different things. And that's why a lot of people will find job postings and they'll say, oh my goodness, they ask for an admin who knows Apex. Yeah, they have a different name for it. They ask for a developer that does mainly admin work. 
They have a different name for it. The problem is there's not a clear standardization of titles of roles. And that's the point of the job description. You're supposed to look at the description, not just the title. That's where a lot of people screw up. They just look at the title and they say, oh, I'm not an analyst. I'm not an admin. I'm not a developer. And they walk away before they even look at the job description. You have to look at the job description because different companies internally have different experience in different industries and with different employees, and they don't understand what the correct naming is supposed to be. So they mess it up most of the time. And it doesn't matter anyway, because at most small to mid-sized companies, you're going to have to wear multiple hats. You're going to have to be the admin, the analyst, the architect, and everything in between, because they don't have a separate employee for all those roles. They need you to serve multiple roles. So what are we looking at here? So there's a few different things, administrators, uh, analysts, architects, trainers, and then just general consulting. This is what you're going to be doing. So in most Salesforce roles, you are going to act as the administrator, the analyst, the architect, the trainer, and the consultant. Now, some of you are probably listening and saying, okay, Brad, but I want to know what those people do. Like, tell me what they do. And that is the whole point of this video series. We're going to get into the details of what you can expect to see. And we're actually going to look at real world requests of what I've seen before, what others have seen before. And we're not necessarily going to tackle exactly how to solve these requirements, but we're going to show you what you can expect to see so you can be mentally prepared for handling these situations. So you're going to have to listen to users, gather requirements, build solutions, and support a Salesforce org. And what you're going to see in this video series. So let's talk a little bit about that. It's going to be fully real world request. None of this is made up. None of it's just something I typed up and said, oh, that sounds like a good request. These are actual emails you're going to see from actual clients that I've worked with, with actual requests for their Salesforce org. Now, as many of you know, every company is different. So some of these emails you're going to see in this video series, it's going to make perfect sense what they're asking for, and I'll be able to explain it no problem. Other requests are going to be very specific to the business processes of that company. And so I'll have to tell you a little bit about it, give you a little bit of context around what this request is about, and then just help explain what functions and features of Salesforce we're leveraging to solve these problems. And that's going to tell you how to bring Trailhead to life, how to bring those certifications to life, and how to better understand what it's like when you're deciding, do I want to be a Salesforce professional? What are the kind of things I'm going to do? That's what we're going to expose you to. So here are a few of the topics that I expect that we're going to cover. We're going to do user management. That's a big one for any Salesforce admin. We're going to do Salesforce security. That's a big one for pretty much anyone. If you're talking roles, profiles, permission sets, Apex sharing, uh, manual sharing, uh, share, all, all the sharing settings, your org-wide defaults and everything in between, uh, we have to figure out how to do that properly. And that comes up pretty normally in the Salesforce world as an administrator. Reports and dashboards. Uh, this comes up all the time. Some people are like, oh, I thought that the business analytics person did reports and dashboards. I thought that the admin did reports and dashboards. I thought the analyst did those. Well, it turns out everybody does them. Why? Because you're the Salesforce professional. And when someone comes with, to you with a request, uh, if you're going to be a quality professional, you don't tell them it's not your job. You get the job done. And reports and dashboards, analytics are a big part of companies. Data is probably the most profitable thing that these companies have. It's probably their biggest asset is the data they have on their prospects and customers. So using that data to build reports and dashboards is a huge part of what helps businesses make decisions, helps them operate their business, and helps them understand how things are trending, where they can make improvements, and where they can do things like cut costs or improve processes. Third-party applications. Salesforce is like a smartphone. If you don't use apps, you just get what you've got. If it's a smartphone, you can make calls, you can send a text, but you can't do much when you download apps. Now your phone becomes something extremely powerful. So same thing with Salesforce. If you just get Salesforce out of the box, it's an extremely useful tool. But when you start downloading apps from the App Exchange, you are going to make it an absolute powerhouse. Some of these are free, some of these are paid, but I can tell you 99% of companies with Salesforce are using apps from the App Exchange. So we are gonna walk you through 
uh, some of the common sort of questions you get. And the, the crazy thing about Salesforce is no matter how much you know, no matter how much training you've had, no matter how long you've spent on Trailhead, you can't possibly know every app from the app exchange. There are tens of thousands. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about how to better understand third-party apps and get good at knowing that you're not always going to know. And you're going to have to read administrator guides on those applications and setup guides and troubleshooting guides and email support. And we're going to talk about how you can do that uh, with third-party applications. Lightning and page layouts. So there are lightning layouts and there are page layouts. And these are just sort of your rearranging, uh, streamlining user interface for the Salesforce users and making sure that their processes are uh, quick and easy to move through from a user interface perspective. So where do the fields sit? Where does the information uh, display on the page layout? Can we make it better? Can we draw attention to certain things that are more important? And how do we do that? We're also going to talk about automation troubleshooting. So in Salesforce, on the declarative side or the point and click side, or basically the non-development side, we have workflows, process builders, and flows. So how do we decide when to use those, when not to use those, and when they come up? Uh, in a nutshell, nobody uses workflows anymore. There is one use case for it. We're not going to dive into it, but no one uses workflows anymore. Um, process builders are extremely powerful, but being taken over by flow. Uh, so when you look at that, uh, getting a better handle on what's going on in Salesforce or process builders useful, 100%. Do most companies use process builder? Absolutely. Are flows going to be the future of declarative automation? Yeah, they are. But that doesn't mean you need to you know, get in a tizzy about learning flows or that you should give up on process builder because it's worthless. Simply not the case. It'll be around for years to come. Take it easy, start learning flows, but Process Builder is still a very necessary tool. We're going to walk through how to create new automations, how to enhance existing automations, and how to troubleshoot automations that are already in place. End user training and explaining. So some things are uh, you need to give them documentation on how to do certain things. These are for your end users, uh, the people using Salesforce. They're not administrators. They're just trying to sell a product or market a product or support a product. And it's not that they're you know uh, trying to get you to do their job for them. They just need proper training and they need to have Salesforce explain to them in a way that helps them better understand how to do it. What does this do? It makes you more efficient because you're not answering the same questions over and over again. And it helps you understand the pains of your end users so that you can make Salesforce work better for the people you're serving, which are the end users. All right, uh, I do do a lot of work in Pardot. So we're gonna talk about some Pardot specific requests that come up. So this isn't gonna be about Pardot implementations or uh, what Pardot is or does. We'll talk a little bit about that, but it's mainly gonna be typical troubleshooting items when you're working in an org that uses Pardot. All right, we may continue to add to this, but this is what we're gonna start with. So this series may grow and grow and grow depending on your comments, your feedback, uh, what you would like to see. But for now, these are the topics we're going to cover. Um, and we're going to look at these requests, discuss how you should be prepared to respond to these and help you think like a Salesforce professional. You're going to feel much more confident about your skills, about your understanding, about what it's like doing the first day on the job and making sure that you feel confident going into the Salesforce workforce. All right. So uh, make sure if you want to see this video series that you go ahead and subscribe, share this with others that you think might find it beneficial. Uh, hit the like button, comment down below. Let us know what you think, what you're interested in seeing, your feedback. And of course, as always, if you want to be a Salesforce professional and you're not sure where to start, start with the free five day challenge at talentstacker.com forward slash Salesforce. Thanks everybody for watching. And I look forward to making this series and getting the feedback.